Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. My name is Patricia Anderson. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm thrilled today to be your producer for this first Monday's webinar. We're back here on Monday. It's not the first Monday because we would rather be aligned with the eclipse than with April Fool's Day, and we're very grateful for you joining us today. We also have a really exciting announcement, which you may have seen in the chat and on pages socials. Um, we will be converting this webinar into a podcast. So you can now find the PSG First Mondays podcast on Spotify. We'll pop that link into the chat for you. This is a webinar style format today. So we really do in, encourage your participation and we ask that you participate by using the Q&A. It's a little uh, set of chat bubbles. It's usually found at the bottom of your screen. You can feel free to pop your comments and questions in there at any time during our presentation. And we'll do our very best to get to as many of them as we can. Once again, I wanna thank you for joining us today. And with that, I'm turning it over to our host, Paige Gardner. Thanks, Patricia. So today I asked ChatGPT to write me an introduction to this webinar. I thought it would be completely appropriate. So here's what Chat thinks I should say. As we approach the 2024 elections, artificial intelligence emerges as a transformative force in shaping electoral strategies, voter engagement, and the overall integrity of the democratic process. The utilization of AI technologies offers unparalleled opportunities for enhancing the efficacy and effectiveness of election campaigns from data-driven voter analysis to sophisticated social media engagement. However, the integration of AI into the electoral arena is not without its challenges, as everyone on this webinar knows. Data privacy, misinformation, and the potential for algorithmic bias raise critical ethical questions. Looking ahead, the 2024 elections stand as a pivotal test for the role of AI in democratic processes. With that generated AI intro, scintillating as it was, let me turn it over to Samir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paige, uh, for the introduction. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we've got your cover slide here. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, delighted to be here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to talk, uh, the, the talk we're going to give, I understand there's a lot of AI practitioners or people that are thinking about uh, AI innovations in this space uh, on the on the webinar. So we're going to sort of, there's a lot of noise about AI, pretty much if you go to any conference, everything, so everybody says we do this with AI, we do that with AI. So we thought we would kind of start off with talking about you know, just kind of ground, uh, anchoring on, you know, what kind of AI is in terms of getting a valuable output or getting something of value. And then talk about, obviously, what everybody knows and is hearing about potential benefits of AI and for humanity. And then also thinking about um, a lot of what we've heard uh, on potential misuse of AI. And then we're going to talk about, at least from our point of view, I'm going to kick it off to Darren. Um, Darren Klein, and he's going to talk about uh, some, you know, how we think about mitigation and uh, how we think about, you know, getting utility from AI, um, uh, for deriving utility in this sort of environment. And for those on the call, what our point of view is in terms of what you should be thinking about. So that's that's a little bit of what our quick discussion is going to be. And uh, so just let's just start off with, you know, sort of what AI is, and I think the easiest sort of metaphor to think about it, um, a lot of you on the call are sort of familiar with it already, um, but just if you kind of imagine it as a library assistant with the library being all of the data, and it's an extraordinarily capable uh, library assistant that can look at an endless number of books, um, and uh, they can quickly read everything and understand every book almost instantly. They can help you find exactly what you're looking for. So that's kind of a, a metaphor for process. Uh, it can curate the best quality of books. So there's like sort of a rubric of like how you would actually look at specific data and decide what's useful and what's not useful. And it provides you recommendations. And over time, it's going to provide you recommendations of things that uh, maybe uh, you wouldn't have gotten, you know, you wouldn't have been able to see, uh, see just by doing it yourself. And so when we think about what are the, how we can utilize these strengths? So obviously there's like speed and scale. Uh, we can use computational power to analyze this vast amount of data, like the library, um, in, in, in the time that it takes a human to example, a single data point 
obviously we're using machines now, um, just like that AI library assistant to look through an entire library and uh, curate the exact book. They could do similarly. Similarly, um, they can look at a vast amount of data rather than just a few data points. Um, they can also be accurate and consistent. Um, you don't have to worry about human error. You don't have to worry about fatigue. You know, a hu humans being fatigued and oversight. So there's this, there's this issue. If you program it, um, you know, that's that's what you can realize as an outcome. So I think everybody on the call or on the webinar that is working with this understands that. And then. The other AI strength is obviously is that it can provide some guidance, right? So there's a process. It's identifying the right things and then it's processing it in a certain way that you train it to and then it's providing you that guidance. So that that type of processing can be anything, but it's it's really a way about thinking about how do you look at data and how do you take it, analyze it and bring it into action. So that's 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 those are the strengths. And then there's obviously a lot of documented positive use cases in healthcare with medical diagnosis and drug discovery. In fact, I think about five years ago or six years ago, way before ChatGPT, there was a threshold passed where data scientists were getting more, were discovering more drugs than actual um, bio, biologists. And so that that's already that transition happened uh, several years ago already. Obviously, improving transportation. We talk about autonomous vehicles a lot in the media. You guys have heard. Um, we all, uh, Paige just talked about ChatGPT and how it could potentially boost productivity. There's a lot of different pivots there. And then advancing any form of scientific research or even in the form of political research. Right. So then we're all hearing about what are those potential misuses in the 2024 presidential election. Some have gotten a lot of publicity recently. Um, but we just kind of look at the five big ones that we kind of see is sort of hyper-testing massive disinformation, basically leveraging advanced AI models to sort of create simulation of various disinformation strategies and predicting how false information could spread across different media platforms and social networks. So that that some sort of hyper-testing could be could could happen. Micro alterations, I think we've already heard of with um I think recently there was the the Biden Robin Robo call that happened, and basically it could be, it could even be in images, and it involves making subtle, often imperceptible changes to images or videos to alter the meaning or context, and it could be tweaking a facial expression, sort of altering sort of background details, or modifying, you know, even slightly modifying text in images. Um, and then a lot of, uh, heard a lot about deep, deep fakes and misinformation um, being used to create sort of fake news sites that, uh, and, and uh, impersonating political figures like the Biden thing that we talked, that we just mentioned. And uh, data privacy violations can be used to analyze massive data sets for micro-targeting voters. Um, in a way that might be considered invasive. Uh, there's no regulation against it, but there's some standards that the EU has implemented, um, but that, that, that certainly we don't have. And then automated propaganda, just being able to generate sort of per persuasive tailored messages, uh, swaying public opinion. There's these fake news sites that look very real and they're really hard uh, for the population to discern. And I'm sure you guys have many people on the call uh, are, 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 are familiar with those as well. The challenge is, is by the time the content's generated and it's already out there, it's already had some sort of impact. Um, there's even like an impact just of having, um, you know, this out there in this environment that uh, the existence of it allows fake information to spread more easily, but also it enables liars to dismiss the truth as being fake. So that's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with. So obviously a lot of changes in the landscape. There's a lot of benefits to it. There's a lot of potential misuse. Don't really know how it's going to happen, but then, you know, I'm going to kick it off to Darren to talk about what does mitigation look like and how should we be thinking about rapid response for those on the call that might be thinking about that. So kick it off to you, Darren. Well, thank you, Samir, and thank you, Paige, and everyone for being here. Yeah, so what I'd like to get into um, and what we'd like to get into is what does true mitigation look like? Um, there are... Uh, if you could forward to the next slide, Samir, there, there are the longer term mitigation uh, measures and things that are that are happening out there. Um, but these are things that that are really not 
happening um, in uh, in 2024 for the most part. Now, many of you may be aware of the legislation and regulation that's happened in in the EU, where they've just recently come out with an with an act to um, to uh, handle and, and mitigate um, AI. Uh, there's also, of course, uh, public awareness and education. Those are things that, that, for example, the U.S. government could invest in, in AI education, emphasizing the importance of educating citizens about AI risks and teaching critical uh, thinking skills to identify misinformation. And of course, there's also the idea of international cooperation. Uh, it's probably not not as likely a one, um, but over the longer term, we are going to need to think about working across borders with different countries and how we regulate AI technologies to ensure a unified approach and to safeguard democratic processes. And international democracies are going to need to align on a set of global standards. But the final one that I want to call your attention to is this technology cooperation bullet here. And that has gotten some press recently as of February 24th. There's been an a, uh, there's been a tech industry accords, um, as it's called, where Microsoft, Meta, Google, Amazon, OpenAI, and several other big firms are joining in a voluntary agreement um, to collaborate on risk mitigation for the 2024 election specifically. And companies are pledging to be more engaged in digital watermarking and transparency, um, but they are going short of banning content under the auspices of free speech. And so as AI continues to develop rapidly, this commitment will need to be increased. And we think it's a very important first step, uh, but it is all currently voluntary and unenforceable. And so a lot of the monitoring st strategies are dependent on things like digital watermarking. And of course, as we just said, those things are unenforceable and voluntary at this point. So that leads us to what do we, what can we do right now? And when we think about it, we think there are two, AI has a couple of major strengths. Um, and so given that there are, you know, I think we all would agree in this call, that there is likely to be massive amounts of misinformation and disinformation in the 2024 U.S. presidential election. And so how can AI help us with rapid response? And so let's start with some of AI's current strengths. And, and we would put those into two categories. One is collecting, coding, and cataloging different forms of online in um, communication as inputs for messaging responses. And the other one is uh, what we would say is massive, uh, and think of that as A-B testing for those of you who are familiar with that technique, but it's a massive testing of messages to determine which ones are more effective after those messages have been developed. And so with that, though, we have um, the, uh, the, let me give a couple of examples of, of how these strengths might be applied. And, and here's one that we call the, uh, it's, it's essentially monitoring right-wing media outlet themes and, um, and testing for counter messaging. And so imagine you have an AI tool that goes onto um, the Fox News sites uh, Breitbart, Truth Social, and, and what this tool does is it scrapes, collects, and codes and analyzes these right-wing media communication for key and emerging themes. And then once those messages are developed, there's then the opportunity to rapidly test different forms of counter-messaging to determine which ones are most effective. And another example that, that Samir and I have been kicking around is what we call counter meme crafting, kind of a similar idea. And again, it's teaching the AI tool to go out and scrape, collect, code, and analyze right-wing memes. And we think there, there, there's good reason to do this because these memes are very 
fast moving and they they they're they're viral in nature and so how do you counter those things well first you have to go out as as noted here you've got to go out and collect these things and you can see a couple of examples these are real memes that we've pulled off off the internet um and and then again once the messaging is developed you can then use um ai to rapidly test different forms of counter memes to determine which ones are most effective. Now, in these two examples, though, you'll notice there's a there's a missing element here, um, which we which we have on the best on the next slide. So if you think of these as steps, we're giving you kind of steps one and three here, but we've we've kind of left out the middle step and just mentioned it. And that is really um, on the, on the next slide, which which has to do with the counter message development and we think for as good as AI is at steps one and three that this missing step of counter messaging development is is pretty uh, is pretty far away in terms of AI development and we think more specifically that things like counter message development require a human team in the near term um, and even if even if AI were to get there and to help in the development of messages, um, we still think that there needs to be a human team to review any and all uh, counter messaging. But at this point, our view is that AI just isn't there um, to to help with that in the near term. Um, but over time, it could be trained and developed um, to offer ideas and prompts to help make a human team more efficient um, but that's going to require uh, a lot of development and so um so we we do think there's a lot of a lot of opportunity here and and we see those um, opportunities in three areas one is to um, aggregate and share as mentioned that's that's really going out and finding those pieces of data and pulling them all together and and, and uh, cataloging, cataloging them and coding them and, and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, and then there are these other two um, pieces of we that we think AI can help with and I'll, I'll turn it over to Samir to to finish finish us off with with those pieces. Yeah, well, I think like I think Darren, you hit it on correctly. So there's obviously the you know where there's an opportunity is to to get um, is to is for people to collectively work together to sort of aggregate and share data because the more data you have, um, the more value you can extract um, and um, applying a unique process. So what's a scientifically valid process? If you take that counter meme example. That's one example of many, but how is a meme distilled and how is the guidance of that meme provided by you, like by, by somebody who's an expert in that field? And then it's just an app idea. It's just the ability to scale the application of that process to deliver some value of high output. So I think that's when you're thinking about when everybody on the call is thinking about, I need to get um, AI, I want to think about rapid response. These are the things that you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about how do I acquire a lot of data that's relevant? How do I apply a uniquely informed process that's informed by an expert? Um, and how do I then um, train that and then make it deliver something that can provide guidance? And that's when we're thinking, this is sort of our point of view when we're thinking about uh, building AI solutions literally in any domain. Um, but specifically for politics, uh, that's how I would be thinking about it. So thank you. That's it from us. And I think uh, I think we do have an example uh, for Matt uh, that we're going to have Matt join us uh, now and give his presentation. He's got some tech that he's developed. He's going to talk through that and then also give a demo. So go for it, Matt. Hello, and uh, uh, th th thank you for that, and uh, great, great and super interesting presentation. Uh, what I want to talk about today are uh, essential concepts in AI. I want to talk about what we're building and then just literally show it, um, just as, as, as a um, as sort of a, a, a starting point here, though. One of the things that I, I, I want to make sure that everyone who's, you know, participating in this conversation comes away from this talk with is uh, a notion of 
you know, the, the different components that we're talking about when we talk about AI, um, you know, there are every, you know, we, we, we interchangeably talk about um, chatbots, entire autonomous workflows, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, numeric representation of text, uh, all of these things are like AI adjacent or like shorthanded as AI. Um, but I think that it's really important to understand what all of these things are and how they're used so that uh, everyone on this call who is making decisions and, uh, you know, trying to both safeguard democracy or, you know, uh, advance uh, the goals that we care about um, is, you know, uh, uh, understands, you know, where the where this technology is and uh, how, how we can best use it. Um, so to just jump in, um, three things that I want to uh, just spend a little bit of time on when we talk about AI, um, we might be talking about large language models. Um, and you know this; these are the foundation models that you know materialize as um, chatbots, uh, you know, with ChatGPT or um, with Claude, or you know, if you're if you're if you're uh, really into it, you can you can mess around with Vertex or you know whatever. Um, so uh, what these what these models are doing um, is 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 literally um, predicting uh, the next word or, or you know token in this case because they're they're predicting. Um, they're predicting a, a number, um, but uh, they're predicting their they're, they're next word predictor. So um, when we think about what they're very good at, it's finishing a sentence. So, um, you know, uh, you and I finish each other's blank is like exactly where uh, these machines uh, thrive. Uh, it's the case that, uh, you know, they have emergent properties that are quite novel. Um, so, you know, I, hypothesis generation does seem to be a thing that, that comes out of these machines. And, 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 you know, that's, uh, that that's largely coming from, you know, how next word prediction play out, but, um, that's, that's really, you know, that's really the, the whole thing that we're dealing with here is like something that is using its extremely large corpus of, you know, with, at this point, like training on the internet and Wikipedia and a bunch of books to, to, to guess how, a sentence would be finished, a paragraph would be finished, et cetera. Um, my, uh, my sort of uh, pick to click on the uh, um, most important thing uh, that, that's, that's developed in the AI revolution though is, um, is, the, is the, embedding, uh, the embedding models that uh, are uh, available from all of the, uh, all of the industrial labs. Um, so you, know, you have your um, ADA embeddings from OpenAI, you have your Gecko embeddings from Google, et cetera. Um, so embeddings are the numerical representation of text. Um, and this is like, when we talk about, we, you know, we taught uh, computers language, this is what we mean. Um, and to, to sort of give uh, two examples here, and I'll also sort of note where um, you can go deeper on this, but um, uh, what, 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 what these embeddings are doing is um, taking, you know, a sentence or a word or whatever and placing it into a high dimensional space, um, which, you know, will we'll, we'll be simple here and uh, we'll talk about two dimensions. So embeddings are essentially latitude and longitude for language. Um, they, you know, so, so for example, uh, uh, if, if, um, if I'm talking about the concept of uh, uh, political parties and I talk about the Democratic Party, uh, just two examples, um, those are going to be very close together. In fact, they're going to be much closer together um, than uh, political parties and the moon. Um, and, and, and so uh, what we wind up with um, with these embedding models is, like I said, a, a stable representation of anything that we can describe in language in, um, in, a, in, in, you know, in, in, in a numerical format, which is extremely exciting. Um, but uh, how these how these concepts relate to each other is like truly just a, you know a, a question of how close they are to each other, um, and 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 that that does really interesting things that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, uh, the, the the example that uh, folks love to use uh, for uh, for how to think about embeddings is uh, you know in, in the old world when we were like you know dealing with like. Uh, you know, bag of words or hot, one hot encoding for um, for like natural language processing, uh, you would mark uh, you would mark a, a corpus that includes the word um, uncle with a, a one. Um, uh, if 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 the, if the word uncle shows up and if it doesn't show up, it, it gets a zero in that column, and you would mark the word 
uh, ant with a one if ant shows up and zero if it doesn't. Um, and in, in these um, stable vector spaces, um, what we wind up with is uncle is equivalent to ant minus woman. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, similarly, uh, ant is equivalent to uncle minus man. Um, and so we're, 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 we're transforming anything that we can describe in language um, into something that we can, you know, do straightforward mathematical operations on. So this allows us to do search. This allows us to, um, you know, uh, synthesize in a, in, in a clear way, understand like how, how things relate. It's a huge deal. Um, the last the last thing that I want to quickly talk about um, are agents. Um, and you're going to probably, you probably haven't heard a ton about agents to date, but my strong suspicion is that this is all you're going to hear about with AI, uh, you know, very soon uh, and for a very long time after that. Um, these um, these are uh, uh, little uh, little machines that are able to take um, you know a, a flexible set of inputs, make a decision, and act without um, without human intervention. So um, you might ask a you might you might ask a chat bot, um, you know, do I need an umbrella today? Um, and that's a it's a weird question to ask a chat bot. You can always you can always just like go to uh, weather.com and uh, you know, look if it's going to rain or not. Um, but a uh, an agent in this case could be programmed to query weather.com, look at the forecast, um, and make a decision. You know, in a pre specified way. So you would you would write in that if uh, the probability of rain is over fifty percent, um, you know, it's it's likely to rain. Um, and you might also write in uh, that you know if it rains, you need to be prepared for that. Um, and so the the umbrella would be. Quite useful, um, but um, agents are, you know, essentially like in, in, a, in a traditional programming context, um, you you can write a function that does a thing with a standard input and it always makes a standard output. Um, this gives us a little bit more flexibility to make a decision based on not exact parameters but flexible parameters. Um, and so, in the same way that you would um, have like a, a real live assistant. Um, help you make a decision because they understand language and can reason a little bit, um, agents do the same thing. And so a lot of where we think uh, the world is going to go in this respect uh, is um, the assembly of agents into um, large workflows that are capable of handling complex tasks. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, uh, but this is uh, this is something that I, I, you know, remember in your ear when you hear about when you hear about agents, um, this is this is like kind of the big thing. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through um, one workflow, and I'm going to like actually make this real and and, and show you stuff. I I know that this is like eating our vegetables first, um, but um, uh, one of the one of the most important uh, things to note about some of the like criticisms about AI uh, are that you know it, it hallucinates. There's no way to validate whether or not the results are true or not. Um, it's it's kind of a mess, um, and uh, so you know the, the the solution to this is to ground things in um, you know in in sort of vetted documents that are um, uh, that 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 you know a person has looked at and a person has said this is correct. Um, this process um, is uh, you know th that that's one implementation of retrieval augmented generation. And so the idea in retrieval augmented generation, and this is uh, I think quite exciting, um, is instead of asking a question to uh, a chatbot or any any sort of AI implementation uh, and and just hoping that its next word prediction is correct um, it, it's it's looking inside of a inside of a database or a data warehouse uh, for answers that come from you know sourceable documents um, so uh, to just quickly go through what that looks like, um, and then I'm going to show you this in practice, but I, I just want you to have like a place to put what I'm going to show you. Um, the way that, that RAG works is you, you start with a knowledge base. So you have some set of things that you believe to be true that can be stored in a relational database, that can be stored in, you know, a corpus of uh, documents that you're like, these are the real deal. It could be source materials from the news, whatever. Um, and so you break those things down into small chunks. So think like paragraphs and sentences. Um, and then you imply those embeddings that we talked about to those paragraphs and sentences. So that that means um, for every for every chunk, we've now got 
a latitude and a longitude that sits on top of that chunk. Um, uh, I write everything that uh, that I have you now chunked up and embedded into a database. And so now I have a place that relates both um, the, the raw content and uh, the, um, uh, and the, the numeric representation of the text. Um, now a, a, a user asks a question just like in any chatbot. Um, but what happens uh, from here is quite interesting. So the question gets converted into an embedding um, and we search for the nearest neighbors. Um, and like I mentioned before, and the reason I, I, I talk about like latitude and longitude here, because we get to literally use distance in the embedding space. So that means um, I can find uh, the, the answers in my knowledge store that are closest to um, answers that could plausibly answer this question. I'm going to select the top some some top number of nearest neighbors, um, and I pass those nearest neighbor um, facts that come from my knowledge store uh, into the language model. Uh, the you know this this is a next word predictor uh, through our context window. So we're saying now um, I want you to answer this question. Here are the relevant facts, and you know derive your answer only from these facts. Um, and, and, you know, sort of like show your sort show, show your work sort of thing. Um, and now we are returning an answer that is not machine generated, but uh, machine synthesized and machine searched. Um, but in fact is, uh, all human generated in terms of like, what is like, where does the, where's the content of the answer come from? Um, so that's, that, that's, that's rag. You're going to see an implementation in a second, but, um, this is, this is sort of like the. Um, the and, and, and an essential thing to understand so that we don't get lost in uh, you know weird next word prediction um, uh, nonsense like ne next word prediction stuff that we can't we can't validate. Um, so you know we we you know we 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 built a piece of software uh, that you know handles some of this um, and we're we're continuing to work on this. Um, so, you know, right now uh, we uh, we allow users to, you know, sync in, uh, you know, their documents, their spreadsheets, their videos, et cetera, um, in, and we apply embeddings to those um, and allow users to chat with, search, synthesize, et cetera, uh, over their own data. And we're also sort of building out our own data here. And, and when I say data, what I, what I mean is uh, stuff that stuff that we wouldn't call data five years ago. So you know, like videos, um, text. You know, the text of bills uh, that, that that you know run through run through uh, you know the Congress. Um, you know, historical uh, um, you know uh, newspaper articles, things like that. Um, and so so you you can do all of those things, and then we have specific agentic workflows that that sit on top of those data um, to help answer specific questions that we know folks have every day. Um, so just, uh, you know, quickly we've got, uh, you know, personalized research assistants, which are essentially like custom chatbots that are domain experts. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can sort of, uh, mess with those and, and understand like how, uh, you know, like what, uh, <laughs> what, you know, ser searching over large, large sections of text and synthesizing that is, is, is quite useful. Um, and, and similarly, we, uh, we sort of handle some end-to-end -end workflows to do specific tasks that are, you know, maybe annoying and onerous, um, but uh, can in fact be, uh, you know, uh, sort of automated now. Um, and so with that, I'm just going to flip over to a demo. Um, so this is our platform. Um, you're going to see two versions of the platform. Uh, we're in the middle of a weird migration right now. Um, so I'm going to just... Uh, show a couple of things. Uh, the first one, uh, one of our co-founders was a part of a campaign. So I'm going to use a little bit of uh, uh, their campaign's data to kind of show um, some stuff. So like, what are people saying about the... Um, okay, so I've asked a question uh, that is uh, going to now search over my drive. Um, and what I'm going to show you here, I've uh, retrieved a couple documents um, and uh, and what, what we've done here is we've actually executed that RAG workflow that I talked about. I, I, I asked my question, um, and I uh, and I, I searched over my whole vector database for candidate uh, for candidate answers. And in this case, I, I identify a um, a set of 
I identify a set of uh, open-ended responses from a survey. Um, I'm now summarizing those, um, and, and, and we just sort of found it in the spreadsheet, which is pretty cool. Um, and now I'm going to ask, how should I talk about uh, that, that, that issue? Um, and uh, this is the last time you all see me type. Um, I just wanted to have some uh, live demo here. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to find, um, uh, we're now finding uh, the message guide as our primary document, um, which is just like the standard campaign message guide. Um, and we're getting a summary. And now this is really great. It's 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 great to um, have, the, have the ability to easily summarize our um, our data. Um, but that is uh, that is probably not going to be sufficient. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you um, one of those workflows that I talked about. So um, I have loaded here this guide that I that I just showed you. It's you know it's like written by a comms director. It's not written for a machine. Um, uh, I've got this loaded up, um, and I'm going to rewrite a message uh, based on how heavy I want the edit to be and at what grading grade level I want the the edit to follow. So I've got this terrible message that you know covers like we're going to talk about this because. Uh, well, you should vote. You should vote the right way on this because uh, everybody loves big government. Um, and uh, if you don't vote the right way, you're obviously not very smart. Um, so, like all the worst habits uh, that that you can have um, in uh, you know in messaging. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and revise the content. And this will take a couple minutes. So I'm going to show you what the revised content looks like, uh, and then we'll talk about what happened here. Um, so I've now, uh, you know, this is like my output. I've rewritten the message to uh, to comply with the guidance that the comms director has written. Um, I have these track changes, and since it was a gross bad message, almost nothing gets changed, almost nothing gets kept. Um, but you know, we have sort of this comparison. Um, and so, just to sort of describe what happened, what happens in this process, and then I'm going to hand it back to Paige. Um, but to describe what's happening here, um, we are taking an arbitrary text document um, and we are extracting three types of rules, pro proscriptive, prescriptive, and um, uh, examples. And, you know, then we've, then we've written, so proscriptive, proscriptive and prescriptive are like do's and don'ts. Um, and then, you know, examples, examples to work them in. And then, uh, and, and from there, we, we then say, um, loop through the entire copy of, you know, the, the editable text and sentence by sentence uh, and paragraph by paragraph, uh, identify any violations of the uh, of the of the don'ts. Um, uh, identify uh, any opportunities to insert do's and any opportunities to insert uh, examples, um, and uh, then you know sort of move those in line uh, accordingly. Um, and you know what's what's really interesting here is like we're dealing with kind of a free text document to extract those rules. Um, we are not sure how many times we want like the the length or the degree of the edit um you know when we say a heavy edit you know does that does that mean that we're changing no more than 90 percent of the document no more than 70 percent of the document etc like what we're dealing with here are um agents that are capable of taking flexible inputs um and making reasonable decisions uh like a human would um and so a lot of what we find to be really exciting about um uh, uh, about this is that like, you know, we're, we're able to take on some of the lowest hanging fruit work, some of the most, um, you know, uh, unpleasant work, uh, that the folks are, the folks who are in, uh, the business of affecting change, uh, are doing, um, and, uh, you know, sort of making it a little bit easier and ensuring adherence to whatever the best practices that, um, uh, you know, the organization's leadership, uh, uh, wants to adhere to. So, you know, we're, we're excited about the, about the ability to help scale um, the expertise of uh, these organizations. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Paige. Thanks, everybody. I think it's very important for practitioners to begin to understand the, the new technologies and sort of the, you know, undergirdings of them, because you, as decision makers, you have to make a choice as to what kind of new technology you want to use in your campaign and for what. So it's really, really important that we educate ourselves um, 
at least a little bit, maybe not in as much detail as Samir and Darren and Matt, but arm ourselves with knowledge about this, this technology and everything it can do. So with that, let me do two things. One, do either of you or all of you have any questions about what each other said? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, I'm just trying to correlate it back to uh, what we talked about and sort of integrate what Matt just talked about. So Matt, the data that you, the the data repo that you're looking, that kind of you use to train um, your your platform there, that was, what, what, what were you, what was the data source there that you were using? Uh, yeah, canonical documents from from a campaign. So the idea here from is a campaign that, campaign that's canonical it. documents. Okay, great. So, so the idea is it's it's it's, it's human generated. So yeah. the, so the the notion of like like these machines don't uh, don't have you know importance or anything like that, and so you have to imbue uh, whatever with with that ranking from somewhere. And so we're we're just yeah. saying like, whatever the comms director thinks is right, whatever the pollster thinks is right, that's what we think is right. For this purpose and you came up with a labeling sort of me mechanism right of labeling the data and then right. what you when you talked about when matt was talking about the do's and don'ts that was essentially the process the processing of the data and then what he just so the like the rules by which the data is then processed was uniquely developed by matt in collaboration with others and then that output that was generated, that was the valuable output, that was the demonstration that you showed, which yep. is like you're getting this valuable output that could hopefully make things efficient. So that's, I was just trying to integrate both of those um, and, and uh, both of those uh, presentations. Thanks, Samir. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, do you wanna open it up for questions? Sure, uh, I was gonna start Matt with a question that I had for you about the RAG model. I'm um I'm pretty new to this information. And so I'm I kind of when you were talking about the rag taking information from a neighbor, that immediately made me think about how humans transfer information, sort of old school gossipy kind of way. And then also made me think that's one of the ways that we get the wrong information. So A, is that logic correct when it applies to AI? And B, if so, how do you how do you fix that? So that that is a that is a great question, and I'm gonna uh, being an old school data scientist, which uh, you know that, that I guess that makes me a dinosaur in AI world. I'm gonna I'm gonna use a, an old phrase that we have, which is garbage in, garbage out. So if yep. um, if you are searching over uh, you know a like a, a large body like a, a large knowledge set, that you can't vouch for um, if it's uh, if it's stuff that you know may be wrong or maybe. Uh, or maybe, maybe like you know, uh, only like contextually relevant without that without that context being explicit, or you know, it's just stupid. Uh, and it is you know a sort of uh, a conceptually nearby what you're asking for. You'll absolutely hit it in the retrieval. And so, like what um, what mediates the quality of, um, of, of 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 any of the rag work is is truly like. Um, what's curated, or um, if possible, if it can be uh, externally validated. So, like it's it's you know one of the things that we do for a lot of our um, for a lot of our stuff uh, is uh, you know if there are um, if there are uh, disagreements among documents, um, we we try and surface those and um, you know have like where the, the citations of where uh, those those disagreements come from. Um, because it's not the case that like answers are always going to be straightforward and black and white. Um, but uh, you know, if if something is if something is you know just polluting, it's like like you want to, you want to be able to trace the source of that, and and citation um, is is essential as a, as a component of that. But um, yeah. you know, like if 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 we're in a world where uh, all data are treated equally, um, you will you will absolutely uh, run into the the problems of, of quality like like you would anywhere else. That's really interesting. Thank you. And yes, I noticed that citation in your demo and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool and handy. Um, so there's, is it safe to say then that you think there's still a definite need for human, <laughs> human review of AI generated content? Um, I, I think that it depends on like where the human sits in the loop. Um, that makes sense. I think that, uh, if you can trust a source. So for example, if, uh, if I'm streaming in the New York Times, uh, or, or you know, I, I have a license to to 
um, you know, uh, download and embed all of all of their response, uh, all, all of their articles or whatever. Um, and I believe that like everything that I am retrieving is in fact from the New York Times. I don't know that I need to like validate that that's that that's a, an issue. Like if, if mm. I downstream thing where I'm like drawing conclusions from that, I think that that's much more likely. But like, um, I think I think that it, you know a lot of this is thinking through where the contain like the source of the contamination um and uh you know where uh uh where we you know where, where we need uh judgment still awesome thank you very much um samir darren we've got a question for you from julie about the a b testing process um that you were talking about and how that is executed sure um i can i can take that and samir feel free to jump in. Um, so A-B process, uh, A-B testing is something that's used very commonly in, in the online world. And so, for example, um, websites do this, this all the time where um, people who randomly, people who come into their site are randomly divided into seeing two different versions of the site. Um, and then they see which which version has the most click through. And so the same can be done and is done um, with with ads. You you uh, you you expose people randomly to one of two different ad forms and you see which one generates the most activity. And and with that, you then go with the as you're um, putting together a media plan, you're then going out and putting out the the ad that's the the more effective of the two and this is done on a massive scale I mean, it's called a b testing but it's you know it's a b uh with many many different messages and 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 over many different uh domains uh, samir anything to add to that no i think the, the whole the idea in terms of execution i think it's really just um you know leveraging machines to scale uh yes. the, the a b testing um i think it's just a very high level High level point there in things that will probably be done um and uh is a, is a good way to think about something that could add value uh leveraging ai in this domain for 2024. cool thank you paige did you have some questions you wanted to ask i do so getting back to the model of how you counter um, misinformation and disinformation if one wants to do the sweeping of the data and then the A-B testing, what if I'm an organizational leader, how do I do that? How do I make it happen? Um, well, the from when you think about scraping, like thinking about, yeah, like, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you just, I think the, the key thing there is to develop um, sort of a, a, a monitoring uh, system where you're looking at things and um, sort of occasionally batching a bunch of you know in, in a in a certain time series you're batching a bunch of things that are relevant to what you're looking for um, from a variety of news sources. So you have to create some sort of machine. You have to you have to so the things you're going to invest in is sort of building out the platform, and then you're going to be investing in making callouts to these various media sources to obtain whether it's images or text or whatever it is that you're looking for, and then you're going to be investing in sort of computational uh, resources, uh, whether you're using Azure, GCP, or AWS, and then you're going to be um, you know, investing in sort of callouts and computational power and then synthesizing that into an output. So from a cost standpoint, there's a, if you're thinking about building something like that, there's an inve initial investment cost that's going to be sort of fixed in building out the platform and the various tentacles that you have to provide and the connections to, to outlets and consuming things via API and other sources. And then there is computational power that you have to think about buying, you know, as an ongoing variable cost. So there's a need in essence to build a tool like this that can be used by a variety of organizations so you can basically amortize the cost. Oh, for sure. I mean, if that's if that's a possibility, just having something like that would be an innovation, to be honest. Having people collaborate in something that was um, you know, that that was useful for a variety of people, uh, that would in itself be uh would be pretty incredible in this environment. Thanks. 
So Matt, if I'm a campaign and I come to you and say, okay, <laughs> what do I need from you? And how can I make my campaign better with all the tools you have? And so what do I, what am I getting? What are the, what are the toys? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, there are a couple of things that are off the shelf right now. Um, and there are plenty more in the hopper, but off the shelf, um, we have, you know, straightforward, uh, chat with, uh, you know, chat with anything in your, um, in your, uh, in your organization's, you know, Google drive or whatever, which is, uh, you know, if, if you're, if you're in an organization that, uh, you know, maybe lacks institutional memory, which I think a lot of political campaigns do. And like, you may not know the research that you did one or two cycles ago, um, and, but it, but it's taped somewhere in the drive. Um, sort of having those integrated workflows is, is quite valuable. Um, we have uh, a handful of, uh, you know, sort of custom uh, workflows that we, we think are quite useful. Um, so uh, the, the, the first few are, you know, standard stuff like, um, you know, uh, 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 like I showed with uh, on message um, adherence to a script, um, we have some pretty straightforward stuff around um, the uh, labeling and like sort of an analysis of uh, uh, raw open ended data that comes from surveys. Um, stuff that's coming pretty soon is uh, going to be on the generative side. Um, so uh, this is, you know, if you have uh living um living materials uh that are you know on, on on the scale of like you know stuff that's coming in from the news or like press releases or things like that um prediction on prediction and completion on those is coming soon um but like right now uh and you know this is uh i i i, I hate to kind of under uh undersell uh what we have but um you know we're i i don't want to uh i don't want to do any over promising here but um you know right now a lot of it is just um, the, uh, like a, a handful of workflows to like solve, solve problems of like adherence to organizational rules and, um, surfacing the insights that already exist in your organization. Um, but yeah, more soon. I, I think this is a really exciting tool for a variety of reasons. One is it truly helps campaigns be more productive, more precise, and just better. But it also, in terms of some of the things that I've been interested in, like you know, innovation and how we can move this, you know, our work forward in a very quick way and an accelerated way because we need to. It allows a gathering of lots of information from different campaigns and from different organizations. And so it affords you the opportunity to build on what's already been done as opposed to like in many cases, repeating it because you don't know what's been done and it's it's a waste of resources to do that so it's exciting for what you can do in the future too as well <laughs> yes Th thank you for making a much better pitch of our product than <laughs> i was able to <laughs> and darren and smear talk to me a little bit more about the means darren you want to go ahead and start or yeah, I mean, I think I think Derek could just talk a little bit about it, but the the idea is really it's similar where you know where you might be looking at like um, cataloging. Where let's just take what Matt just talked about, what he just demonstrated. He was looking at a catalog of campaign documents, and they were labeled a certain way, and um, and then th that data labeling is sort of like you think about a data table, and you have like you know, location, address, this, that, whatever. He might have several hundred roads of that related to attributes of a campaign document. So similarly, you know, there's thousands and thousands of attributes. There's literally a million pieces of metadata in every image. If you go to like, you know, Bing image or Google image, there's millions of metadata. So it's really understanding what are the data, what is the data that you care about? And how how would you process a meme a certain way? So uh, Darren could talk a little bit more about that, about maybe different types of components and thinking that we're talking about, but it's it's extracting um, sort of the way in which you would look at a meme and the way in which you would respond to it in a scientific way, and then training a machine to kind of do the same thing at a very large scale. So Darren, you want to- Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, I was I'm just saying- 
Can this be used in real time? Can this be like a rapid response kind of tool? I, for think, a I think what we what we envision, and, and, and by the way, this has uh, more applications than than um, politics, because um, as you know, we don't <laughs> most of our work is not in politics. Um, but like you know, this is if you can envision um, right now, our sensitivity would be you know, we still need human at the end, at, at the very least at the end of this process. But, you know, what, what would be the North Star for us, even just in the short term, would be coming up with a way in which we could provide guidance to somebody that was creating a counter meme. So a meme, basically, if, if there's a very powerful meme that you're seeing gets a lot of traction, how do you provide, here are like five things that you need to do, or 10 things that you need to do uh, to construct a good counter beam. Darren, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, that's that's great what you said, Samir. Um, the, I, I think I would add a couple of things. You know, one is there's, so there are these distinct stages there. The, there's the cataloging and the collecting phase. Um, and that's really, the word I would use there is developing a taxonomy yeah. of memes. And, and what I've noticed in looking at some of these memes, some of them are um, two-sided or comparative um, you know, there's always an implicit comparison there and, and sometimes an explicit comparison, um, uh, but others, others are not. Others are just, uh, you know, yay for our side, whatever that is. Um, and so, so there, it's a way of coming up with the, a different uh, catalog and typology of these messages, but how you then respond to those messages would be different based on the type of messages there are. And I think the, the framework for that still needs to be developed in terms of what would be uh, a response to a two-sided message versus a one-sided message and, and, and how do we do that. That's where I think the real R&D work needs to be done is in that uh, yeah. phase of it. Um, but as I said earlier, the, the cataloging and collection phase, I think that's probably closer closer and at hand. And by the way, this can be, that's an example, right? So this can be applied to any sort of thing. If you feel like you have a very unique process in how to treat something, how to look at a piece of data, a piece of ad, uh, some sort of copy or something that somebody's saying, and you have a very unique way of, res of kind of processing that information and providing something, that's how you think about using artificial intelligence. Like that's, that's exactly how you think about doing it. Well, I think these tools are exciting and it's very important for us to learn about them, how to use them and the best you know, choices that a organization or a campaign can make based on their needs and their strategic um, goals. So with that, Matt, do you have a last word? And then Darren and Samir? Uh, I mean, I, I guess just just thank you. Uh, it was a real, real pleasure to be able to talk about this stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so excited about uh, all the developments that are that are coming and so excited about what Samir and Darren are doing. I think that uh, not just like retrieval, but like the uh, the world of actually like moving the ball forward is like very, very exciting. I'm great to hear about it. I'm glad to hear about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paige, uh, for for inviting us to do this. I, I the, the one the one thing that always comes to mind, Paige, when we talk is just the uh, the importance as as we're thinking about this year of collaboration. Um, so having um, more like-minded groups get together and do things and um, really, or build on what others are doing, because what you would hate is to have large investments going into duplicative efforts. So in the spirit of needing to win this presidential election, I think there's a important call to action of collaboration page, which I really appreciate everything that you're trying to do. So well said, Samir. I don't think I would add anything to that. I think that's that's so well said. It, it really is about collaboration and um, and coordination and trying to make things happen as uh, as as a collective group here. So thank you. Thank you. And I think that innovating, as I was saying earlier, in a very accelerated fashion, is so important for us. And your tools, everybody on this webinar. Uh, it will help us do that. So thank you. And um, Patricia, do you have any final words? 
I'll just um, say thanks to everybody for joining us today. Be on the lookout for our podcast announcement for this episode, and hopefully we will see you back here next month. Sounds good. Thank you.